Welcome as you join us for this midweek, whether you're a member of Akadui or Crossgar or joining us on the internet as a visitor, you're very welcome and it's a privilege to be able to lead you as we look together at the Word of God. We have been looking at the life of Elisha and this evening we're going to look at chapter 7 of the book of 2 Kings. Now Elisha is only mentioned in the opening couple of verses and I had contemplated moving into chapter 8 but this story that we're going to consider tonight of the four lepers is really an instructive story, very challenging and very relevant at all times uh, for us. So we're going to look at this great story tonight. Before we do so, uh, let us come to God in prayer and seek his blessing and his help. Father, as we come to you, we thank you that you're a glorious and a faithful God, a God who is deserving of our worship, a God who draws near to us through his, through his Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the promise keeper, that all your promises are yes and amen. And we come therefore with confidence, knowing that you are with us and knowing that you will never forsake us, even in the most testing of times. And Lord, we acknowledge that even when we don't see it, we know that you're at work in our lives. Indeed, even when we don't feel it, you are still at work. Help us to trust you more fully and help us to lean upon you, to depend upon you at all times. We ask today that as we read your word, we will know the help of your Holy Spirit. You will give to us understanding. And Lord, as we would read together and study together, and as we listen to your word, we pray that we will not just hear it, but put it into practice. May it affect how we think, and through that, how we act. And may you be glorified and honoured in everything. We commit this time to you, and we ask for your blessing and for your help. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read together uh, from God's Word from the book of 2 Kings and reading the entire chapter. We had read the first few verses last week in our study, but we're going to read the uh, full chapter um, this evening. So beginning at verse 1, this is the Word of God. Elisha said, Hear the Word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, I see a flower will sell for a shekel, and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, announced Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go to the camp of the Armenians and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Armenians. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Armenians to hear the sounds of chariots and horses and the great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and close, and went and hid them. They returned and entered another tent, and took some things from it, and hid them also. Then they said to each other, We're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, We went into the army in camp and not a man was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the armies have done to us. They know we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out, and then we will take them alive and get into the city. 
One of his officers answered, Make some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all the, these Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. He followed them as far as the Jordan and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of flour sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trembled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. It happened as the man of God had said to the king, About this time tomorrow a sea of flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? The man of God had replied, You will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And this is exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Amen. We thank God for the reading of his truth. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 7 and the story particularly of four lepers. Now as we saw when we studied chapter 6, the king of Syria has sent his army against the city of Samaria, Israel's capital city, and surrounded it. And they blockaded the city so the residents couldn't get food and the situation has become desperate. So much so they have even resorted to cannibalism. Now, outside the city, meanwhile, a separate drama is unfolding. There are four lepers in an even more dire situation. I want to think about their story today. We will learn something about human need. We will be reminded of the mercy of God and also challenged about our responsibility to share the gospel. Note first the desperation of these lepers. They are despised lepers, these four men. And because of the stigma of this incurable skin disease, they're ostracized. They're outcasts from their society. We're excluded from the mainstream of life in the city of Samaria. And so these four could never hope to re-enter the city of Samaria. They were forced to rely on friends and family to throw some food their way. But now because of this siege by the Arameans, the people of the city are desperate, they are starving, they have no food for themselves and there's no hope of any coming the way of these four lepers. It's a bit like uh, the current pandemic, how it's affecting those in the margins and those who are most vulnerable. They are the ones who suffer the most. Well, these four, they were suffering and their prospects indeed were very, very bleak. Now they clearly recognised their plight because that's very apparent in verses 3 and 4. We have a summary there of their discussions. There were four men at the entrance of the city. This is what they said to each other. Why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. In other words, they calculate they have only really one choice, one choice only, and that is to go to the camp of the Arameans, to the enemy camp and surrender. And if they spare their lives, then that's fine. If they take their lives, well, they're going to die anyway. So they conclude, if you like, they have nothing to lose and they have everything to gain. And they're prepared to take the risk Four men with leprosy. Of course, we are aware that in the Bible, leprosy is often taken as a symbol of sin. The presence, the presence of, of leprosy here meant that these men were separated from society. That was so contamination would be avoided. It meant isolation. And physically, the lepers would be corrupted by this disease and eventually it would destroy them entirely. 
But in the same way, the disease of sin separates men and women from God. It also produces decay, spiritually speaking, unbelief, and eventually spiritual death. And that's what Paul says. The wages of sin is death, writing to the Romans. Now here the lepers understood their plight. They understood their desperate situation. But sadly, many today fail to appreciate their hopeless, sinful condition. Many in our society view themselves as, well, reasonably clean. They might admit they have some imperfection and some flaw, but certainly not serious enough to warrant them worthy of condemnation by God. But the reality is simple. The Bible teaches we all inherit sin. We're all corrupted by it. And this sinful nature of ours makes us an enemy of a holy God. We will therefore be destroyed by it if we do not do something about it. And the first thing for a person necessary to experience cleansing and deliverance from God is indeed to recognise their hopeless and desperate condition, to appreciate that they have no resources to save themselves, just like these four lepers. You see, these four lepers appreciate the seriousness of their plight. They acknowledge there is only one hope, one possible means of survival, and so they resolve that they will go to the Syrian camp. For the person crushed and burdened with sin, under its condemnation, there is hope. And that is when they go to Jesus. Peter in Acts 4, 12 states that there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is Jesus alone. The story is told of a miner who got separated from his colleagues underground. He had no lantern. And he was wise enough to know that he shouldn't take another step in the dark because he was in danger of falling down a deep hole and perishing. And so he cried out, lost, lost, lost. Some of the other men heard him and they came and brought their lanterns and they were able to rescue him and point him to safety. But you see, the person who's never asked God to cleanse them of their sin and forgive them, they've never turned into repentance to God. They are helpless and they are lost and they need someone to bring hope and to guide and direct them. But the first step is to realise that we're miserable, we're lost. We're in a hopeless situation, just like that miner knew he was lost on his own. Just like these four lepers understood they were desperate and they were needy. Note, first of all, the desperation of the four lepers. As we continue, we notice not only the desperation of the lepers, but then secondly, we notice the delight of the lepers. The four desperate men wait to twilight before heading into the Syrian camp. And surely they do so with real fear and trepidation, with real trembling. However, their hearts are warm, their fears are turned into amazement. In the camp they find food, they find treasures beyond belief, and not a single person in sight. And what was their hope? It was simply that the Syrians would take pity on them, not kill them and provide for them. But God had gone before them, and miraculously had scattered their enemies. One scholar says the Syrians experienced an auditory hallucination. But to put it in far simpler terms, the Syrians thought they heard an army approaching and they conclude that the Israelites have hired mercenaries to come to their aid. And in a panic, they have fled, leaving behind them valuables. And more and more importantly, enough food to literally feed an army. And the reaction of the four men is astonishing. It resembles a group of children at Christmas grabbing each new package in sight, ripping off the wrapping paper and clutching each amazing new find to their chest. That's what they seem to do. They splurge upon all the food around the camp. It's a provision way beyond their wildest dreams. Of course, there's a spiritual parallel that's very obvious. Sinners who are lost and helpless with no future will experience wonderful blessings beyond what they could ever imagine when they come to Jesus. These men hoped for mercy, but they experienced God's wonderful providence. They came to the camp apprehensive, fearing judgment, 
but found fulfillment and satisfaction. And sinners who recognize their hopeless condition and turn to God will experience something far beyond what they could ever dream of, what they could ever expect. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, tells them they've not only been blessed with eternal life, but the Lord has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, he says. There is wonderful spiritual abundance for the person who finds Christ. He or she would experience a deep, deep peace even in the storms of life. He or she would experience a true sense of fulfillment, a true sense of satisfaction and contentment, something that only God can give. And there is absolute certainty that all who turn to God for help will not be rejected because of the work of Jesus. Sacrifice of Christ allows God to be merciful to the sinner because Jesus has paid for our sin fully and finally upon the cross at Calvary. Mercy means we are no longer condemned, but along with mercy comes healing and blessing and provision. And all this time the people of Samaria remain in desperate hunger because they're unaware of the provision that was so, so near to them. Therefore, the lepers come to realize that their delight is something that is wonderful, but they cannot keep this good news forever to themselves. And so as well as the desperation of the lepers and the delight of the lepers, notice also the duty of the lepers. The duty of the lepers. Evangelism has been described in these terms. One satisfied beggar telling other hungry beggars where to find food. One satisfied beggar telling other hungry beggars where to find food. And that sums up well what these four decide to do. Go to verse 9. They say to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. And that's what they do. And the remainder of the chapter is taken up with the various responses to this news. Now, these men are conscious of their duty. They appreciate the need for urgency in the matter. And surely, in a spiritual level, it's a stern rebuke to believers who enjoy God's salvation and fail to share the good news of the gospel with others. The enormous spiritual privileges that Christian enjoys also bring great responsibilities. The challenge is to seize every opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with those who are perishing. Now the people of Samaria continue to suffer oblivious to what God has done to provide for them. And there are many today who need to hear the news about what God has provided for them. There are multitudes in our land that need the hope for life that is provided only through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus and it is not right to remain silent. Indeed, for the one who is saved, not to share this hope of the gospel with the unsaved is to live in disobedience. A little boy returned home from his first experience of Sunday school, and his mother inquired, Who's your teacher? A little boy immediately responded, I don't know what her name is, but she must have been Jesus Christ because she didn't talk about anybody else. The challenge is, do others ever hear us talk about Jesus? Is he so much of your life, of my life, that we cannot help talking about him and all that he has done for us? Having received the good news, it's interesting how the various people reacted in this story. The gatekeepers receive it, verse 10, with enthusiasm accompanied by emotion of joy. But then moving to verse 12, and we see the king is suspicious. He thinks the Syrians are bluffing, they are simply setting a trap. And then there's the officer of the king mentioned in verse 13. He's cautious, but he suggests sending out scouts to check it out. And in verse 17, we find the officer who had scoffed at Elisha's prophecy perishes in the gate because of his unbelief. 
Now all of these reactions are found today to the preaching of the good news of the gospel. Some believe like the gatekeepers. They recognise it's good news. They celebrate the gospel. Others are sceptical and maybe a bit fearful like King Jehoram. If he had not been encouraged, he would have surely perished in the city because of inaction. And some indeed are like the king in the fact that he was suspicious. He wanted to know more. It sounded too simple. It sounded too good to be true. It's almost as if he was saying, where's the trap? And some people, when it comes to the gospel, of the same mindset. Where is the trap? Where is the hidden agenda? The idea of salvation as a free gift is too incredible. It's too easy. Indeed, it flies in the face of life experience and religious thinking. But there is no trap. There is no hidden agenda in the gospel. The blessing of the gospel of salvation is freely available to all. Of course, there are others who are hesitant, like the officer who, re who reserved judgment. He sends out the scouts to check if it is genuine. And there are those today who feel some draw by the gospel message, but they want more information before they will decide about Jesus. And the reality is God calls for commitment, for a definite decision to follow him. If a person is not careful and wants to know everything, to be fully convinced first, to have every answered question, every question answered first, then there's a danger they will never take this step. It is dangerous to delay. But of course note what happened to the officer who scoffed, he was trampled in the gate. A warning to those who scoff the promises of God. A reminder that unbelief will be severely judged by God. But as I conclude, I want to point out the two statements that really sum up the challenge of this story. One is in the form of a question and the second, well, could easily be translated into a question. The first is for the person who has never prayed the prayer of commitment and received Christ. The second is for all who have, all who know Jesus as their Saviour. Two questions that, if you like, sum up this story so well and its challenge. The first question is this, why stay here until we die, asked by the lepers in verse 3. Why stay here until we die? They realised they were doomed, as things stood, that action was absolutely essential, it was absolutely necessary. And of course, the Bible tells us that those who are unsaved are in desperate condition. They have no hope unless they do something. And that being the reality, the question the unsaved should ask is simply this. Why remain in this sad condition? Why stay as we are and perish? The four lepers, you know, took a calculated risk in going to the Syrian camp. However, there's no risk, no risk in going to God for spiritual help. He assures us that the one who flees from sin and turns to him will find mercy. He will receive that person. He will cleanse their hearts. He will set them on course for heaven. He will give them wonderful riches and blessings. So why should any person go to a lost eternity when God offers life, joy, peace and the blessing of heaven? That's one question we might ask. Why should we stay here? Why stay here until we die? But then there's a second question. We could rephrase verse 9 in the form of a question. Is it right to keep this good news to ourselves? Is it right to keep the good news of the gospel to ourselves? This is a challenge to Christians to be active in evangelizing, to be active in sharing the good news. Jesus gave the great commission to all believers, not just to some, but to all. Go and make disciples. What would you think of these four lepers if they hadn't bothered to share the good news? You would be very critical of them, I'm sure. And you know, they could have found excuses. They could have said, we're not welcome in this city. We've been treated with disdain, so why should we bother about them? They don't really care about us. Or they could have put it off another day and said, well, one, one more day won't make that much difference. And we too can find excuses for not evangelizing. We don't want to offend. We're not sure what to say. 
people aren't interested. It won't make a difference really and many, many more. Or maybe we could say, well, why should I bother? Maybe deep down we don't care enough. But Christians should share the wonderful good news of the gospel about Jesus as he has commanded. Two questions if you like sum up the challenge of this passage and those questions are relevant to everyone, to everyone, to every person. For some, the question is, are you perishing and doing nothing about it? And for the believer, are you saved? Saved by God's grace, but keeping the wonderful news of salvation all to yourself. Amen. Let's bow in prayer for a moment. Father, we thank you for this passage that we've studied. We thank you for his clear challenge. And we think of these four lepers and we thank you that they found delight and the provision in this Syrian camp. An illustration that indeed those who turn to Christ will also find great riches and satisfaction. But we thank you also that they thought of the people in the city. They realized their obligation to share the good news. And we pray that those who are Christians will be challenged by this. That we will understand that we have a wonderful message of hope for a lost perishing world. Lord, give us the passion, the love and the desire to share that good news, give us boldness and courage and the desire to share Jesus, that others might come to know him and experience the joy of sins forgiven and have in their hearts that sure and certain hope of heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I close, I just want to point again to a few things on our prayer line from the Presbyterian Church to lead us in our prayer of others. And for Wednesday, the 29th of April, SPCI Residential Facilities asked to pray for our residents and tenants that they may feel the calmness in the new routine and be protected and for all the staff at these homes, for family and friends. And we do pray for the PCI Residential Homes indeed for all nursing and residential homes at this time. On Thursday, we're asked to pray for the well-being of society, for those who suffer from mental health difficulties, asking that God will enable them to cope, particularly at this time. And pray for society at large, for the stresses and strains and uncertainty at this time. And tomorrow, for ongoing ministry matters, for encouragement, uh, for congregations that are vacant, as they wait to call a new minister. And also for the applicants for their day ministry and for deaconesses who are applying, who were recently interviewed as they learn of the outcome. So let's pray for that also. So let's come before God and pray for these things and pray for the ongoing work of the church. And just a reminder again that on Sunday we have our Sunday School Live at 10.30 and 11 we have our service. And this week particularly, a good number of young people will take part from the Youth Fellowship in Cross Gar, and young people also from Akadui. They will do the bulk uh, of that service uh, and please encourage them by joining and listening in. And we're thinking particularly in Philippines too about shining as lights in the dark and depraved world. So can I encourage you again to listen in to that. So let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, as we come to you, uh, we are directed by our church, think, particularly to think of residential facilities. We pray for the residents and tenants of PCI homes, that they would find a calmness in this new routine, and that you protect them and bless them. We pray for all the, the staff involved and all the challenges that they face and the fears that they encounter. We pray also for our family, friends, for those separated from their loved ones. And as we pray for the PCI residential homes, we are conscious of all nursing and residential homes in our land. We pray, Lord, that you would protect the residents and that you would draw near and bring to them your comfort and your joy. And we pray for family members no longer able to visit. We know they're concerned and they're anxious, but in their pain and worry, and distress, may you draw braces close and bring comfort and strength. 
We pray for society in general, particularly for those who suffer from mental health difficulties, asking that you enable these people to cope with the current anxiety and that, Lord, you would be to them all that they need. And we do pray for society at large with all the uncertainty and stresses and strains as a result of this coronavirus. And we pray, Lord, that you be near to all, particularly those in responsibility and government, that you will give wisdom and discernment in all the decisions that they would make. We pray for our ongoing ministry. We pray for each Presbyterian church. We pray particularly for uh, churches where there is no minister at this time. And we ask that during the vacancy, you will enable uh, the convener and the elders to lead with boldness and with courage and grant to them your help. We pray that you give them a clear vision for ministry and that you will bless the people in the absence of one to pastor and to lead them. We think too of individuals, of applicants who have been recently interviewed for their day in ministry and also for the diaconate. We pray that uh, you'll be with them as they wait to learn of the outcome and by your Holy Spirit that you would be at work in their lives. Give them wisdom and help them to discern the path that God would have them to take. We just ask indeed that you be near to each one. We pray for our services on Sunday. We thank you for the young people who will contribute and pray that you will be near to them as they prepare. We thank you too for the Sunday school and for Alice. We pray not only for our own service here, but for all churches around us of different uh, denominations as they seek to worship you uh, through the media of Facebook or YouTube. We pray that what is taught will be a challenge and will be an encouragement to all who will listen. And we just ask in these days that we will rejoice that we can still worship together. We can learn from your word and we can pray together as your people. So we ask now that you would continue with us, that you will guide and direct us. And may each one know your rich blessing in their lives day by day. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.